So that said, I am starting with wine number one. And let's see, okay, um, per usual, we have some uh, things to consider because, you know, not all of us are as practiced at this perceiving and defining business. And these are some points to consider as uh, I talk to the wine and you taste through it with me. So the first one is near and dear to my heart, considering whether a wine is, you know, rather neutral in aroma, semi-aromatic or highly aromatic. Because because especially uh, in the deductive process, this can be very telling. And uh, secondly is the fruit character. And this was one that I was inspired to throw out today, driven by citrus, orchard fruit or tropical fruit and or, because it's not mutually exclusive. You know, wine can have all three of these in it, but sometimes there's one compelling element. So. Again, uh, a question to ask yourself, because when you get to the uh, deduction part of the, uh, the game, you know, this may be helpful to you. And finally, something that we talk about with regularity is the texture, what we call also the mouthfeel, um, you know, which is related to acidity, certainly, but not exclusively, and least contact, but not exclusively. But, you know, this will um, be telling uh, in your deductions as well. So, uh, that said, let's go ahead and start with wine number one. And per usual, we never um, minimize the importance of the, um, the visual aspect. And this wine to me is actually a really classic pale straw. Um, and it has definite glean, uh, green glints in my uh, pretty direct light here with the silver rim. So it appears to be quite young. And again, uh, you know, we're not drawing conclusions from the appearance, but it's certainly something that we tuck in our pockets for later consideration. Uh, it seems to move quickly in the glass. Um, you know, we'll be assessing uh, alcohol once we take it on the palate, but I do pay attention to how it whirls, you know, whether it, uh, it clings uh, when it's a white, which doesn't necessarily express high alcohol or sugar, but can give uh, you a nudge in the direction of some um, a weight and extract. So aromatically, it is, uh, I'm just going to tell you what I'm perceiving. I can't not say this is highly aromatic because it is. It meets me 125% uh, of the way out of the glass. I don't even have to get uh, all the way in the glass to smell it. It is super expressive. And um, the compelling fragrance to me right away is certainly fruit. And it's a combination of both citrus and tropical. Um, you know, the citrus element is uh, this wonderful uh, combination of grapefruit, both pink and yellow or white, if you will. Freshly squeezed lime, freshly squeezed lemon. You know, I don't think I'm going to be able to perceive um, tree fruit or stone fruit until I get it on the palate. But also there's a second wave of uh, tropical fruit in the form of freshly cut pineapple, that beautiful combination of, um, you know, sweetness and sour sourness that pineapple radiates. And on the heels of that, there's a fragrance of uh, flowers, super fresh um, lemon and lime blossom. So citrus blossom. And on the, you know, on the heels of that, I'm getting a wave of freshly cut grass uh, or parsley. So super fresh herbs and maybe a little bit of pyrocene as well, but I'm gonna confirm that on the palate. And then the herbs, big time. You know, I mentioned parsley, but also lemongrass, verbena, everything in that uh, super fresh green category. It's a wonderful, compelling aroma. I have a hard time actually picking it apart because it's so integrated, but I'm gonna go ahead and take it on the palate. And the acidity is positively bracing, but not so much so that you would call it lean or austere. It's palate cleansing. I'm going to immediately take um, another sip because I find that the first approach of acidity and tannin on my palate is almost um, uh, abnormally or dramatically elevated. So I like to, I like to um, normalize it a little bit by a second taste. This is so delicious. I swallowed a little bit of it. So am and it's I only wine one? And it's only wine one, you know, yay kit 136A. <laughs> so 
uh, super palate cleansing. And as I'm going through the check checklist, everything is there. There is dominantly yellow grapefruit here and lime. There's a little bit of um, peel, zest, phenolic quality to the wine. Um, when I'm, I'm actually actively looking for tree fruit or stone fruit, and I certainly get green apple, you know, maybe some unripe pear, but it's, you know, it's a, a secondary element. There's the pineapple. And um, this may sound slightly precious to you, but there's a little bit of a saline quality to you, uh, that I think reminds me of, um, of uh, tamarind. Uh, I eat a lot of Indian food, so that comes to mind. Um, you know, the pyrocene is there in the form of more, I think, green bean be than bell pepper, if I were to really hone in on it, maybe a little bit of green olive and um, jalapeno. The herbs are uh, absolutely reflected on the palate as well, specifically parsley, fresh cut grass. Um, what strikes me is at this tasting for me, not only is the finish long, it's positively swelling. It is a um, good thing that it's delicious and um, it is, um, error free because not only is it going on and on, but it's becoming more compelling. I get a little bit of a rocky minerality to it. If in looking for some organic earth, you know, maybe an undertone, but it's not um, obvious. There's another aspect too to the mouthfeel, especially once you accept the acidity. There is a little bit of a waxy lanolin texture um, that could be the result of lees contact or uh, a grape variety. Boy, if there's oak aging on this wine, it's lost on me. I mean, if it is in there, if this wine is experienced it, it's super neutral oak and not for a very long period of time. So what do we have? We have a highly aromatic cleansing um, white that has, um, you know, compelling acidity, super fresh, both in its expression of citrus fruit, uh, tropical fruit, um, herbal notes with some floral and um, uh, vegetal elements, a uh, touch of salinity and minerality. And uh, here's our consideration and I'm still tasting it like a house on fire. So Sauvignon Blanc or Sauvignon Blanc blend, which would uh, imply what? Uh, classically, Semillon, and please vote, 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 because it's very useful to everyone, both your, us and your, um, you know, your, your partners out there. Um, your co-tasters. So Sauvignon and Blanc. And it is anonymous. It is it's sorry. utterly anonymous. So, you know, you, you can be shy and vote at the same time. So Sauvignon Thank Blanc, Semillon, uh, and or Muscadel, if we're talking about a white Bordeaux style thing. Albarino, aka Albarino in Portugal, which, you know, edges um, uh, closely into floral elements. Viognier, ditto on the floral. Um, perhaps, you know, Albarino and Viognier to me, depending on the expression, move into more semi-aromatic than highly aromatic, but again, more of a, a floral element. And then in terms, and don't forget other, you may be listening to all of this going, that's lovely. I don't think it's any of these, and I'll be happy to share what I think it is. Poll is closing in 30 seconds. Region, old world, new world options, France or Spain, which definitely would come into play for Sauvignon Blanc and uh, Alvarino and Viognier. Well, Alvarino more in Iberia and New World Chile in California for certain Sauvignon Blanc. Uh, and I'm sure you can find uh, Viognier um, in both of those countries as well, not as much uh, Alvarino. Are we revealing yeah. Limang or do you want to uh, gonna, address I'm gonna something end else? The poll. Yeah, I'm going to end the poll right now, but I have a really interesting question here from Scott's um, Scott, and he says, would have guessed New Zealand, which is not on our list here. Um, why not New Zealand and would have this uh, acid been higher? I actually think that's a, a very um, a straightforward, commonsensical question. Why not New Zealand? It certainly has elements of New Zealand. We just opted not to put it on here. And maybe that was um, an oversight on my part. Um, you know, maybe it should have been uh, Chile and New Zealand if we wanted to make it even more interesting, if it is indeed Sauvignon Blanc. 80% of the peeps think it is. 20% think it's Alvarino. All the shy people are not telling us it's something else. And we've got an almost even split between France and Spain. In terms of the acidity level, I think if anything, 
um, you know, the New, Ze the New Zealand acidity might be padded with even more expressive fruit. So, you know, acidity sometimes can be a little bit of a fake out um, depending on an illusion of sweetness from ripeness of fruit. So I don't think it would be higher or um, lower compared to uh, Chile, especially. Okay. Mm. Wonderful. Um, so Maddie, I'm gonna go to the next slide. Are we revealing? Yay. We are, where are we? Starting in San Francisco. We always start in San Francisco. And then we're taking one of my favorite trips, which is on Google Earth, and we are moving. Um, I believe we're staying in this hemisphere, correct? And we're going further south. We are going uh, significantly further south. We are indeed going to Chile. We are going to um, the Valle Central, the Central Valley within which we're in Rappel and within that in Colchagua and within that at a um, an estate uh, near a village called uh, Marchigüe. And we are actually about 19 miles from the Pacific, which is pretty damn close because when you look at Colchagua, it really spans from you know um, the Pacific coast inland to the, um, the foothills of the Andes. This is um, uh, an area in general that's super, you know, suitable for fine wine production, the Central Valley. And um, we've got influence from both uh, the Pacific and um, the, uh, the Andes in terms of cooling elements, but especially the Humboldt current forces cool sea air inland. And in this case, what it's doing in a growing region that actually is, gets plenty of sunlight and warmth, still needs to be irrigated, but it, um, this was an area that was very much um, researched by this uh, producer, Kalku, and um, they ended up intentionally wanting to plant, I think, about um, a thousand acres of uh, mixed varietals, but they were looking for an expression of fresh fruit, and they certainly got, got it in this. This has about 30% of semio, which I have to tell you, for me, hides a little bit in plain sight, but I think I can perceive it more on the palate than on the aromatics. Um, it is a 2021, we'd accept 2020, and that makes sense to me because it's particularly expressive. It's not hiding anything. Um, let's look at our next um, slide. And this is typical of the landscape here, rolling hills. And uh, you know, to remind us, we've got um, coastal uh, ranges that block the air a little bit, but um, those uh, sea breezes come in effectively nonetheless. And um, what else to tell you about this producer? I think they are, uh, uh, this gentleman, Ricardo Rivadenera is actually the, he is a venologist, but he is um, officially the general manager of uh, their wineries and uh, has directed them for uh, over a decade now. Kalku, by the way, means healing doctor in the local language. And mm -hmm. uh, I think this is a wonderful expression of uh, Chilean Sauvignon Blanc. I mean, truly, I you know move over you know New Zealand and California. It, it manages to be um, you know a brass band without being. Um, uh, how can I put this? It's not in any way common or rough or, um, you know, dominating. It's just beautiful and mm -hmm. layered and complex. Gentlemen, do you want to uh, pipe up? Do you think uh, my enthusiasm is warranted? Nope. Sorry. Oh, I, I, I would concur with you. I think people often um, forget about Chile and the conversation about Sauvignon Blanc. You know, we're so... Uh, knee jerked to either uh, New Zealand in the new world, France in the old world, we sort of forget that there are all these other places on earth that make Sauvignon Blanc in the new world. That would, of course, include Chile, but also South Africa does a lovely job with it. And uh, given the relative scarcity up until this past year, this harvest of Sauvignon Blanc in New Zealand, um, it's been important to be able to expand your thinking and look to some areas. And while some um, Sauvignon Blancs coming out of Chile tend to be a bit shrill and mean uh, and really hard and, this one. And, and, yeah. pyros and that sort of green peppery pyrozinic character, this one is broad, it's round. Um, I concur with you. I think that the texture and that sort of lanolin y character of the uh, Semillon come out there and add complexity to the wine. And, um, you know, Ricardo and team, I think, really 
uh, knocked this one out of the park, as they say. It almost makes me want to have a restaurant so I can pour it by the glass. After so many years on premise, I still write BTG next to some things with my <laughs> no, um, with my pen. But I, um, Tim, do you like it as much as we do? And do you think it's a good yeah, example? Yeah, I do. Of type? I, love it. I think it's uh, you know, as Evan mentioned, it's kind of a different hue color uh, in the spectrum mm -hmm. of of uh, Chile and Sauvignon mm -hmm. Blanc. And, and Evan, to your point, I remember when we were down there, many of the wines were just in your face, pyrazenic and mm -hmm. were really phenolic and almost gritty. And this is gorgeous. And this is really one time where the Semillon added to it, not only just evens out the texture, it really adds aromatic lift to the wine. So it's pretty, and the delicious factor is also big here. But you know, you know, I'm sorry, go ahead, Lee Ming. Oh, there's a question here from Scout that I want to make sure we answer and then we have to go to wine number mm -hmm. two. Sorry, Maddie. Um, mm -hmm. The question here is, does the higher elevation provide this breadth of fruit? Is that where this breadth of fruit is coming from? I think it's coming from the, um, the you know, the cold breezes and um, the sunshine where you get this combination of ripe uh, with, uh, you know, delineated acidity and uh, you know, Evan, you're more intimate with this area than I am. Would you agree with that? Yeah, no, and it, it actually um, occupies a very unique uh, place in, in Colchagua. Mm -hmm. It's where it's a confluence of two river areas, and it's a very sort of low, gravelly kind of soil mm -hmm. and all that, and it's very unique. The Tingarica, and I'm forgetting the other name of the thing right now, and it provides just, you know, a gravelly, gravelly uh, mm -hmm. so soil element to it, gro almost grove like dare I say, mm -hmm. but I do think that um, it's also a combination of, the, of the, the nature of the fruits. The Semillon has one profile of fruit, Sauvignon Blanc has another. Um, I don't believe it's monoclonal or monoselective. I believe they actually have a couple of uh, massal selections of Sauvignon Blanc fruit. Don't forget that Sauvignon Blanc came to Chile long ago in the mid 1800s uh, when Cabernet did after uh, the money was made in uh, copper in mining. And a lot of this old massal selection fruit that they have there is, is really only exists there. It's being brought back to Europe now. But I think oftentimes, again, we overlook the range and profile of styles. Now you have to make it well too and make it in a non-linear way. So it's not green and, and asparagusy and peppery and all that too. And but, passing um, the it potential off to, is there. Passing it off to wine number two, I will just encourage everyone memorize this because it's a really great example of a new world, highly aromatic grape variety, uh, you know, an expression of it that is complex. How cool mm -hmm. is that? Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. All right, well, let's move on to wine number two. And this is a wine that is um, very different in personality coming off the first wine. And obviously there's an intentionality uh, to doing that. Uh, the color itself is perhaps a tad darker. I might put this one more in that mediumish yellow and not so much in the straw vein, although one person's medium straw is another person's medium yellow. Um, when I swirl it around in the glass, it does have some weight to it. Um, my tears are falling a little bit slower and a little bit thicker um, than the, the wine I, I had previously. And the color itself perhaps doesn't show as much um, green in it is, as Madeline's does, uh, but it's not brassy, it's not gold, it's not amber, it's not showing any significant age or anything like that. And the darker hue, of course, can come from a number of sources. It could come from barrels, it could come from the skins of the grapes themselves, um, inherently the grape itself, and then um, age. Those would be sort of the three primary things that darken the color white wines um, have. Most importantly, but all, all the joy, for me at least, is always in the nose of the wine. And right off the bat, whereas this last wine came off in its sort of pungent, herbal, greener, grapefruitier character, this is on a completely other end of the spectrum. Is there citrus there? Yes, but where Madeline's was more, she said, fresh lime, fresh lemon, juice, uh, grapefruit, pithy, rindy, all of that. This is really ripe citrus. So it's a ripe satsuma. It's a ripe uh, orange character. It's um, just really... Uh, flamboyant almost in, in in its nature. Ditto the tree fruit, whereas uh, Madeline's uh, previous Sauv Sauvignon was more like on the green apple side. This is more in that ripe golden apple side, maybe the ripe Bosque pear side of things. You've got a much more exuberant um, uh, element of fruit, but where it really strikes me is the stone fruit. The stone fruit, I think here is what drives the wine and whether it's uh, in your mind's eye, a peach, whether it's an apricot, whether it's a nectarine, all of those sort of in that sort of same ripe, sweet stone fruit um, character, probably not so much plum, but definitely peach and nectarine, I think are what drive it. And um, then there we kin in the tropical vein. So 
pineapple before, maybe mango this time, a little bit of uh, papaya perhaps. There's just this whole panoply of flavors there. Like you've literally, um, you know, gotten off a plane, thrown a lay around your neck and went head first into a <laughs> fruit market or something like that. It has a very sort of tropical, delicious, wonderful character. Uh, latent floral things underneath, a little bit of honeysuckle, a little bit of freesia in there. Uh, herbal perhaps, but more on the sweeter side, maybe more chamomile, maybe there's still a bit of uh, of verbena here, but maybe not lemon verbena, maybe more classic verbena there. Very voluptuous uh, in nature, very, um, again, just sort of rich. What I am noticing here though, are two things that don't scream, scream at me. Nothing screams oak to me. And if anything, the sort of real uh, significant fruit character probably suggests to me that they went intentionally to not put oak on this wine because the fruit itself was so pretty. The other thing I'm not getting here is any distinctive minerality, uh, either organic or inorganic. There's no sort of earthy notes to it here. This is, um, I don't want to say fruit bomb because that has such negative connotations to everybody, but it is fruit pure, it is fruit, fruit delicious in its uh, nature. And then lastly in the palate, Uh, it is round. The, the, the attack, attack, attack is relatively soft. That's what happens when you conflate attack and soft. You get a talk. That's what happens. So I have a soft attack. The palate itself is creamy. It's round. It's smooth, like a good Barry White song. Um, and uh, long, too. Not, not perhaps as, as penetrating with its acidity as the first wine was, but the acidity is balanced for the context of the wine. Um, I think it's probably from the standpoint of, of age and acid to everything like that is um, an element of, of showing that it's probably, I, you know, I wouldn't put it away for like four or five years. I think this is a wine for enjoyment now and maybe in the next 18 to 24 months. I think the fruit itself will get more um, uh, mature over time. And I think the joy of this wine is in the youth of its fruit. And I also think that the acid is perfectly balanced to it. And if anything may die down a little bit. So uh, I'd enjoy this wine right now, but it is relatively expansive in its finish. And I think when we figure out what it is later, um, a really lovely example. Evan, so what, what do we got? Think? Yeah. Yeah. Um, there's a question here from Alejandro. If you thought that there was some sesame that um, you smelled in there, he's getting sesame. Yeah, yeah, no, that, there's there, there's there's elements, soft elements there of underlying soft um, nuttiness, sort of a sesame halava character, or maybe a pine nut character, or maybe a, um, a raw almond or raw cashew or raw macadamia character that's as much about the texture as it is there, but it does sort of pick you a little bit with that. And if that um, suggests to me, again, given my, my statement that I really don't believe there's oak here, what it does suggest is that there's some leaves contact there and you're picking up a nuttiness over time, um, albeit probably a short period of time of, of some autolytic nature. So. Um, Again, is great. You spend the time on the leaves. All right. So what do we got here? We got Chardonnay. Chardonnay um, can be super expressive, probably not as expressive as this, depending on where it is, but it does have that texture. Torrentes is um, aromatic, uber or aromatic, um, and maybe this on steroids, depending on where it's grown, but usually in its most typical uh, northern Argentine or Argentinian uh, Riojana or Saltania, tends to be a little bit bigger there. Viognier um, is known for sharing a lot of those same textures too. So all three of those I think would be legitimate choices to make, although I would probably err towards the middle two. And then of course, other there are other grapes that are aromatically ripe and expressive. Um, Viognier, it's gonna say a lot of them are other Rhones. Roussan could fit that bill. Um, Roll, Vermentino could fit that bill, other stuff like that. And then of course, you've got your um, places there that those wines could be associated with. I think that we are um, kind of, I don't know, 30, 60, and people just kind of um, in the other camp. So mm -hmm. I wonder if people in the other can sort of articulate what was missing from the choices that you wanted to pick. Um, that might be interesting. Um, and then Evan, do you, see, do you see anything savory, like cheesy about this wine? 
No, not really. I mean, I think if anything, uh, Alejandro's commented about it being a little nutty is probably spot on. Cheesy, uh, to me, or that cheese rind thing is also sort of a yeasty, lazy related thing, but it's not, um, this it does, it has a pungency to it. Um, and I'm not getting that here. Here I'm getting, if anything, there's a subtlety uh, to any uh, potential least contact that might exist. The other thing I am picking up now more in the finish is there is a slightly um, bitter or phenolic uh, element to the finish there, which if anything, probably based on the, con the um, color of the wine might suggest some skin contact. So you have 44% in Tarantes, 56% on Viognier. Yeah, yeah. Um, I don't know Good if you want to explain it now or? No, no, but I think good, call, good calls, both of them. If anything, Torrentes to me probably comes off as being a little bit more expressive in the floral end of things, Viognier more in the fruit end of things, but I've had Torrenteses with super expressive fruits and I've had Viognese that are very floral. Um, and um, so, but, but again, both of them could be right. And as far as locations go, you know, France has grown certainly uh, for Viognier, uh, Spain, probably more so for uh, Torrentes rather than Torrentes uh, in Rioja and then the other areas there too. So let's see where we are. All right. Uh, where are so, we starting? Are we starting in Chile? Goodbye, Viña Maquis and Calcu. And the plane goes up or the reverse bungee cord, depending on how you want to view that. And we move up and we're, uh, we're getting back up into the 30,000 foot range and the plane is gonna move and the plane is going to head back up, up, up. And so we have a comment here from Marshall. Evan North. Wells is moving. Yeah. Um, uh, that more tree fruit is leading him to Viognier. Did you yeah. also experience that? Yeah, well, if, I mean, if we talked about stone fruit versus tree fruit, you know, those are all grown on trees, right? So I would suggest that that strong fruit does. And Viognier, um, mostly in the new world, certainly, um, does have a richer texture to it. In the old world, probably less so. But in mm -hmm. fact, um, we are um, in the new world and we are up in a, in a, you need warmth to get Viognier ripe. And that's where we are. This wine is indeed a Viognier. And it is indeed from California, but it's perhaps not from, you know, most people, when I say California, it was interesting. I was up at a think tank thing yesterday and we talked about how, you know, 10% of California's production between Sonoma and Napa are 95% of most people's thinking of. And then they forget there are other places. And San Luis Obispo uh, in the central coast, the southern part of the central coast, not the far south, but the sort of middle south, um, is home to probably California's best expression, in my opinion, of Rhone varieties, of which Viognier is probably one of the leaders of the pack of the white Rhone varieties. And I think that um, Paso is an area where it sings and it sings in an alto voce. And that's what you've got here. This is pure, unabashed New World Zinfandel done correctly uh, in the sense that you do have all the New that World Viognier. <laughs> New World Viognier. Viognier, uh, the other Zinfandel, right? The others, yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, Viognier, did I say Zinfandel? I meant Viognier if I said <laughs> Zinfandel. That's all right. That's okay. all right. Uh, but Viognier, and it does extremely well in this part. By the way, Zin does well down there too. But Viognier is really expressive here. And all of that sort of orchard fruit that we talked about before, the waxy texture, the exuberance, this wine has not kissed a barrel, but it has spent about five months on the lees. It's 100% done in a stainless steel. It's 100% um, in, in, uh, done from a single vineyard as well, too. Uh, the Steinbeck Vineyard down in Paso is a very um, renowned vineyard for Viognier. But what's interesting in this case is that um, the sort of all of the, these elements here preserved perfectly in Paso Robles as we move to our next slide are actually not bottled in Paso Robles. And in fact, um, oftentimes what you'll find is wineries that seek out really high quality of fruit um, do so from places where they don't do it well. Now, Minor Vineyards, as many of you know, sits in Napa. Napa is not known for Viognier, but they really love Viognier and they love Rhone variety. So they do source further south. They source some Pinot Noir down in the Santa Lucia Highlands. And um, that's what you have an expression of here. Michelle uh, Shafir um, does a tremendous job down there. I've uh, been on a couple of webinars with her. Last time we did Pinot, which they sourced from a couple of vineyards down in the San Lucia Highlands. And she has a very deft hand uh, with all grapes. But I think that this to me um, is when California Viognier goes right. Sometimes they tend to be a little OTT over the top and they're sort of like soap. And, um, you know, I call it the Walgreens princess soap thing when you're taking your eight year old daughter with a tutu on into Walgreens and she points and she goes, I want 
that. And it's a little princess shaped bottle with pink shampoo and pink body wash in it. You pour it there and it makes lots of bubbles and it smells like oh, Viognier. Yeah, smells I'm going like Viognier. to buy one. Buy one of those. <laughs> but this is not like that. This is, I think, pushing the edge of what Viognier can be when it wants to be there. Uh, in French expressions, it tends to be a little less expressive. The French would tell you that this one is all about the peach and nectarine fruit. And the French versions is all about the skin and the area closest to the uh, to the skin, which is not quite as ripe being French, of course. So le voila. Awesome. Um, Tim, I'm going to ask you for some help because you're you're always good for this. Help me catch up. Uh, wine number three and okay. number four, so we don't leave oh. Maddie with five minutes. <clears throat> okay. All right. So, uh, hello, everybody. Uh, now to the first red wine. And take a look at these questions real quick. What does the depth of color in wine number three tell you about possible grape varieties? Well, if it's Pinot Noir, it's Pinot Noir on steroids, right? So what we're faced with are, relatively speaking, thicker skinned, deeper pigmented grapes. And so that should help narrow your universe when it comes time to make a conclusion. And then uh, how would you describe the earth and mineral qualities of the wine if they're there? And we'll just tip the hand by saying, yes, they're both there. But, you know, think about how you would describe them. And then finally, how do the levels, once we get to the structure and actually tasting the wine, how do the levels of alcohol and acidity tip you off in terms of the place and the climate where the grapes are grown? Okay, that's a lot to consider. So let's get started. Um, here we are on the site. It's a very deep ruby. But I also want to, to point out that as you tilt your glass forward carefully over a white background, notice that the color is a little bit evolved. So it's not a real youthful pink or fuchsia or purple or something like that. You know, you've got some garnet or salmon that's creeping in. So maybe the wine has a little bit of age. And as soon as we smell the wine, we're definitely going to know that. Okay, from there, uh, in terms of legs, tears, Marangoni effect, and la di da. Notice uh, for a wine, what's interesting with the wine with so much depth of color, it's really, you know, the viscosity, what I still insist on calling it, is not really high. So it looks like the alcohol here is medium plus, about 13.5%. But again, we'll find that out when we check out the ripeness of the fruit and then check the alcohol on the palate. Okay. And notice also that keeps in line with the depth of color of the wine that it stains the glass and it should with that kind of color. Okay, now to smelling the wine in the main event. Okay, so this is a highly aromatic and complex red wine. There's a lot of stuff going on here. And the first thing I'll point out, which connects the dots to the color of the rim or edge of the wine is that, you know, there's a little bit of evolution or maturity here. So the fruit is ripe, but it's also dry at the same time, and even a little raisinated, which equates as, you know, time either spent in the barrel aging or in the bottle, or in this case, maybe both, okay? In terms of fruit, I'm getting two major categories. First of all, red, really classic red cherry and red plum, here ripe and dry, and then black currant, darker fruit, black currant, black cherry, black plum, uh, cassis, and again, those are, are dried and ripe together. On top of the wine, if you pull your nose out of the glass, there's both a little bit of lavender and rose and they're dried. So once again, speaking to the wine with a little bit of age here, there is a green leafy vegetable quality. Also on the nose, there is mushrooms. Uh, there's other, you know, almost aromatic herbs like bay leaf, bay laurel, and a little bit of sage. It's leafy, almost like tobacco, dried tobacco leaf. Uh, other things, uh, there's a little Chinese five spice in it. And then we get to earth and mineral. And as I mentioned previously, there's both. And to me, it reminds me of uh, just potting soil or turned earth or even gravel along with the mushroom. Those two kind of things go together. And then there's a, a little bit of, of just what I would call stony minerality to it. In terms of oak usage, yes, there is. And it's a moderate use of oak. And you can get that by a little bit of vanilla, the toast, there's kind of uh, bitter chocolate, little cocoa powder, and maybe uh, what else? It's almost like really almost overly blue, brewed black tea. Okay. So once again, a lot of stuff going on. All right. Why don't you taste it for me? Mm. Okay. All right. That's very interesting. 
As you would expect with a red wine, the fruit, all of it turns tart on the palate, especially the red fruit. It's almost like cranberries now and craisins, dried cranberries. Uh, it's dried uh, cassis, things like that. Uh, what else about it? The, uh, there's a graphite pencil lead, uh, which is usually from oak, by the way. And there's, the, it becomes, the earth is much more pronounced. The herbal qualities to it, it's like dried bay leaves, yeah? And uh, what else? There's almost a chalky texture to the mushroom and potting soil. And the oak makes its presence known on the finish and it's really structure and it gives the wine a frame and it's smoke and toast and, uh, and like baker's chocolate, unsweetened chocolate. In terms of structure, let's taste it again. As your attorney, I think it's always a good idea to retaste wine before you talk about structure. Hmm. What's surprising about this wine? Another surprise is that for a really deeply colored, dense, rich wine, it's not heavy. The alcohol in this is maybe 13 and a half. Interesting, which means what? The wine was made from grapes grown in a temperate climate, right? The acidity, salivary glands are working, is medium plus. The tannin here is medium plus two, and you can taste the oak on the finish, but there's also grape tannin in the front of the mouth. So here again, that would equate to the way the wine looks in terms of depth of color being from uh, a deeper pigmented, you know, probably fairly tannic red grape, or at least if it's a blend, one of them is tannic. And that's always something to consider. What else about it? The finish is long. I think the wine is, is very complex and um, persistent and just wonderful to drink or taste. Okay, Li Bang, what does the envelope say for choices? Let's see here. All right. You have your choices of Malbec, the polls coming on. Mm -hmm. Dolcetto, Mal Merlot yep. blend or other. Yep. And then we've got our regions here, uh, two in the old world, of course, Italy and France, and then two in the new world, Argentina and Washington State. Very okay. diverse choices. So to point this out, those of you that are queuing off color, I didn't do you any favors here, did I? <laughs> no. Because all three of those grapes are really deeply colored, right? So you're going to have to work a little bit harder. Uh, Malbec to me, you know, a member of the Cabernet family. So to me, uh, if you think Malbec, you're probably thinking one or two places and probably, you know, Mendoza and Argentina, in which case it would be probably a bigger wine, much more fruit, uh, less earth and less non-fruit and a little bit of pyrazines, you know, the uh, pyrazenic quality, right? Uh, Dolcetto to me would be a totally different animal altogether. And Dolcetto to me wouldn't be this tannic. It would have a lot more fruit to it. And odds are you're gonna taste a Dolcetto that doesn't have this kind of bottle age. There are always exceptions, but it's true. And then maybe the acidity not is quite as elevated. Uh, Merlot blend here, we're looking at, of course, mostly dark fruit, but a plummy quality, uh, an herbal quality. And if it's a blend, odds are it's Cabernet Sauvignon, which accounts for some tannin. Okay, so if you think it's Dolcetto, you're definitely going to Northern Italy. If you think it is Malbec, you're going to Argentina. If you think it's a Merlot blend, uh, you're going to go to France. If you're convinced there's enough earthiness that drives the wine, or if not, you're going to go to Washington State. So here we are. We, We've got yeah, we Dolcetto. can see here Tim. Yeah, mm -hmm. go ahead. No, I was just going to say. So people either opted for the Dolcetto or the Merlot blend. Um, and then went to Italy with Dolcetto or Old World France with a Merlot blend. Okay. So let's see where we're going on the Magical Mystery Tour. All right. Here we go. And now we're going to leave the central coast of California. Tim, and do you we're think do people... Oh, sorry. I, I, as it's turning, because it's turning a little slowly, I just wanted to sneak in a question if you don't mind do you think that people yeah. were so firmly in the old world because of the sort of the sort of more age uh you know to, do you see how why what is it that's helping everybody get to the old world well i think just the the pronounced earth and mineral quality to the wine you know mm -hmm. i mean even, even though it's a white wine take a look at the minor dna from before where there's really almost a lack an entire lack of earth and mineral and you go, huh, well, fruit and some winemaking drives the wine. Here, the place drives the wine. So here we are in Bordeaux. 
Uh, and we're the Omenoc. Uh, we're, I think, southwest of Saint Julien. And we're away from the Gironde. And, and, and um, Evan and Madeline, I'm sure you will both remember when you took, oh, you guys didn't even have an intro course. Okay, so when I took the intro course, the first thing they said about Bordeaux is that the closer the water, the better the soil was in terms of gravel and it drained. Hence, the properties that are best are closer to the Gironde versus though farther away, which tend to be Cru Bourgeois, which is exactly what this wine is. So here we're um, in the Omedoc again. The producer is Chateau de Taillon. It's Cru Bourgeois ex Exceptionnel, which is a classification of about, mm, I think, over 100 different chateaus. But those are the best estates in that area. What's interesting about this is as you look where the arrow is, and you can see Saint Julien, one of the great communes in the Medoc. So it's southwest of there. And as I mentioned, once you move away from the Giron, the, the soils get from alluvial, which is gravel created by you know, a, a river system over thousands of years to where they're deeper and they're clay based. So the wines just taste different. They're earthier versus gravelier. Here, this, believe it or not, this wine is 70% Merlot. And you wouldn't think it because, of course, everybody thinks Left Bank Bordeaux being Cabernet dominated, but Merlot is the most widely planted and grown grape in all of Bordeaux. Okay, mm -hmm. so here we are, Chateau de Taillon. The, the property dates from 1896 when a gentleman named Henri Cruz bought an 18th century chateau that had vineyards planted around it. And over the next hundred or more years, it was kept in the family. And since 1992, five sisters named Cruz with Amel making the wine uh, own and run the Chateau. And the Chateau is a, a French historic property as are the cellars and the altarpiece that's in the chapel. And here we have 70% Merlot, 20% Cabernet Sauvignon and 10% um, Cabernet Franc. It was, or it was somebody interjecting, I, I, I'm talking real fast. No. <laughs> okay. No, I was just saying that it's a very beautiful chateau picture. Yes, it is. It is. It's absolutely gorgeous. I think here, you know, everybody gets fixated on the 61 chateaus and the all the classified growths. And we forget just how many good properties there are and how the wines are so affordable. And, you know, just here's a wine that's mid 20s that just offers exceptional value. And not only that, this wine's eight years old now and really just starting to show its stuff. So um, I hope this will get all of you out there to, to take a look at Bordeaux again the next time you're in a wine shop, because yeah. uh, to me, just in terms of the elegance and finesse for Cabernet based wines, and Merlot best wines, it's it's just great stuff. Oh, I wanna chime in. I mean, I just wrote a comment in the chat, Tim. This is worth memorizing, Miss Nose. This yes. is mature Venice, but you know, it's got a life out of, uh, ahead of itself. Bordeaux, you know, move over uh, classified growths. It's also in a terrific yep. vintage, 2015, yep. um, that is, you know, forward, expressive. Um, I don't think uh, Cru Bourgeois um, should, you know, push anybody um, yeah. away from it. It's I, really, really nice. Remarkable and great selection uh, to the team led by Evan here. Um, Alejandro asked a great question. It gives me an opportunity and great pleasure to say that Alejandro, that information that you just asked about the alcohol is available on the bottle. We wouldn't be able to ship this to everyone legitimately if the alcohol content isn't on. So you just have to rip this little overlay off and the identity of the wine, as well as the alcohol content, 14% is available on this particular product. You can, of course, see the full um, tasting note on our website. Tim, thank you very much for sharing this. And I also want to just a shout out to um, Scott. I love the candor. So um, if it was a surprise, thank you for saying that so that we can sort of gauge where people are at as well. And for those of you who chimed in, that was spot on. Thank you for explaining also, uh, Marshall in particular, how spot on it was and what, what helped you along the way. Tim, the next wine, wine number four. Okay. All right. Yeah, let's move into wine number four. And as they say on TV now for something completely different. All right. So everybody, as you take your glass number four, you tilt it forward. First of all, the wine is purple. <laughs> it's shamelessly purple in color. It lightens up to like a fuchsia rim. Uh, it is fairly deep in color, but doesn't have the depth of the Bordeaux for sure. Uh, still, my wine, you know, glass of wine stains. Yeah, so there's considerable staining. 
And what else about it? The tears, legs, et cetera, also seem to be moderate. All right. And then on the nose, please take a moment. And my goodness, is that different? <laughs> All right. So here we've got a combination of blue, red, and black fruit. And the blue fruit to me is kind of like the whoopee cushion. It's something after, you know, the previous wine, which is a very straight ahead, beautifully rendered Bordeaux. It's just Wow, is it different and it's really pretty. It's like fresh blueberries. There's also a lot of red fruit. There is sour red cherry, strawberry and raspberry here. The condition here of all this fruit is fresh and ripe. This is a youthful wine, unlike the previous wine. And there's black fruit. So there's blackberry and black cherry and maybe some black plum, but everything is fresh, it's bright. And you would expect the acidity on this wine to be lifted from just how bright and how the wine pops on the nose. Okay, what else about it? There's definitely some rose above the glass and it's fresh once again, really pretty. And then dark leafy greens. Uh, there's other non-fruit type things such as brown mushrooms. Um, I think there's you know, a little bit of fennel you know, that almost minty quality to it, and cola nut, which I actually, I like that for a descriptor. Um, there's tea leaf, there's bergamot, there's, to me it smells like verbena, and uh, what else? There is the, the hard candy like ricola, sassafras, and whorehound to it as well. So there's kind of a, a sweet herbal quality as well as the lighter toned like verbena. Uh, in terms of earth and mineral, there's both. I think it's predominantly, though, the mineral, which I get on the palate, but there's still some turned soil along with the mushroom, and there's really no oak to speak of on this wine. It was probably aged, A, in stainless steel, or B, probably in large, you know, neutral uprights. And if that's the case, we're going to sense the texture, uh, mm -hmm. a rounded texture of the palate, and let us see. What else about it? Oh, well, let's taste it for the structure. Mm. And it's a very curious combination of very overtly fruity. Mm -hmm. And, um, but here, this is a great example of a wine that is overtly fruity, but dry. So notice mm -hmm. what happens as the wine travels across your palate, all of a sudden you're left with acid and a little bit of tannin and uh, kind of a licorice aftertaste. And, but notice the fruit just entirely goes away. And so, that, you know, the lesson there is that the true measure of residual sugar in any kind of wine is generally going to be the finish, even though most of the taste receptors for sweetness of towards the front of your mouth. Yeah, they go all the way down uh, to your esophagus. Okay, what else about this? Um, alcohol to me, again, is restrained, moderate plus at best. The acid is medium plus plus, a little higher. It's really elevated, as I expected, by the brightness of the fruit. And the tannin, surprisingly, is medium. You know, this is a really uh, drinkable, appealing, you know, uh, quenchable type wine that you would just enjoy a glass and it's absolutely delicious. It doesn't eat food. What else about it? The finish is medium plus and complexity is medium plus. Okay, now I threw a lot out at you in terms of putting all that information together, leaping, let's see what we have for choices on the menu. Okay, so everybody Pinot Noir, and you might be tempted to think that in terms of the, the weight and the depth of the wine and how heavy it is and all the fruit, the problem is, is that unless they're adding something like Syrah, you're not going to get Pinot Noir that's that color. Pinot Noir is red. It's not purple. And that's one of the few times where I would tell you to key off the color. Zinfandel is possible. The only thing I would look for here, unless it's a dry creek Zen from a producer that really pulls the reins back in, in terms of ripeness and alcohol, uh, maybe, maybe not. And then finally, here we go, we're throwing a knuckleball, not even a curveball. We're throwing a knuckleball at you by, with, uh, with Seigel, which is an Austrian red grape. And uh, we'll talk more about that in a moment. Okay, so your choices are, if you're in the old world, you're thinking maybe that Pinot Noir might be from Burgundy, okay, that's where you would choose France. If you're gonna go to Seigel, you will probably go to Austria. And then if you're going Zinfandel, of course, California would be your go-to and uh, your other choice for Pinot Noir might be New Zealand. Okay, all Tim, right. Tim, I have to just say the amount of time it's taking to get even 45% participation tells me that people are a little confounded here. Um, 
it's good. it's a it's a good thing. I, I love yeah. you know there are some wines the speeds are like like they're on some sort of uh, game show and this wine in particular <laughs> it took us forever to get the first vote in. So guys, again, mm. anonymous for learning purposes. I'm gonna end the poll in about ten seconds just to give you one last chance to get it in. Isn't it funny that people don't want to be wrong even when it's anonymous? <laughs> That's true. It is true. You're yeah. accountable to yourself. Well, but you know what? Yeah. yeah. You, nobody learns without getting it wrong. Absolutely. That's right. That's Absolutely. right. Okay. Okay. So everybody went for the weird choice, <laughs> <laughs> which is great. You know, and, and hopefully yeah. you arrived at that decision by process of elimination. Just saying, well, that's like no Pinot Noir I've ever had. And then Zinfandel, it's just not rich and fruity enough and peppery and all that good stuff. And that leaves others. So you, some of you may have gone out there and gotten some really creative calls with it. But then the rest of you said, well, Zweigel, whatever it is, it must be Zweigel. And we'll talk more yep, about that in a see. second. Let's see where we are Bye, France. in the wine world. And so we're leaving France. And, and fortunately, this is not like the last few flights. This is a pretty short one. So I'm sure we're going to just... I'm going to take you know from the Bordeaux airport, and we're going to. Why did the Why did the estuary Why did the estuary in the Gironde look so murky? Time of year, who it wasn't knows? blue? Yeah, yeah. There we go. So here we are. We are in Wagram, which is uh, in what the Austrians called Niederösterreich, which translates as Lower Austria, which is crazy because it's in the northern part of the country. Well, what they're talking about is that Nieder, as in lower, is it applies to where the Danube River is on its course, eventually to the Atlantic, right? And so here we are in Wagram that used to be called Denalan. Notice to the left, you've got the three designer appellations that people probably know about, the Wachau, then Kremstal and Kamtal. Those are all actually very small. And all three of those, what they have in common is they're practically all white wine, Riesling and Gruner Veliner. Uh, with uh, Wagram, it's still 70% white wine. 30% uh, though is red wine, and that's planted predominantly to Zweigelt, which we'll talk about in a moment, but also Blaufrankisch and then another grape called Saint Laurent. So Zweigelt is a cross, which means you've got two body different grapes. Uh, not to, you're not cross mogenating two different species of grapes, but here you're cross mogenating uh, Blaufrankisch and Saint Laurent. And there was Dr. Heinrich uh, Zweigelt, who did that in the 1920s at Kloster Neuburg, the big wine academy. And uh, and then it really wasn't propagated until after the 1940s. But now, of course, in the Wagram, at least it's the most widely planted red grape and accounts for, you know, basically 70 percent of all red wine made. And as you can see, most of the wines are very fruit forward and uh, delicious and supple and fun. But some of them from older vines, especially when they're blended with Blaufrankisch, can have structure to them and be age worthy. OK. The winery, this is Weingut Default, and that was founded in 1972 by Heinz and Paula Default. Both of them grew up on the farm locally in the Wagram area, and so they purchased a 30-hectare property, and of course, it was planted to Riesling, Grunewald, Lehner, and Zweigelt. And then their son, Martin, took over. And there's some hilarious things on the winery's website. They said, and I quote, we are not fond of Barbie wines or greenhouse tomatoes, unquote. <laughs> and then the other quote that cracked me up is Martin. So they sent Martin to enology school at Kloster Neuburg, which is what you do, unless you send your kid to Geisenheim in Germany. And then they sent him all over the planet to work internships, hither and yon. And then they brought him back and quote unquote, threw him into the deep end of the pool to figure it out. <laughs> I love Talk that. about tough love. Anyway, this, but Martin, of course, and that's him and his yeah. wife. And, uh, and, the, and the, the great thing about it is that, you know, he, of course, moved the winery to sustainable farming. Uh, within five years, and then the last three or four vintages have all used native, native yeast permits. So he's really pushing, pushing, pushing to do things in a different way. And I think this is delicious wine. Okay. You have really described them. Look at this picture. This is yeah. the best. Is I, have a, I have a question. Tim, there is an exotic element to the 
fragrance on this. Does that speak to Zweigel? Does it, I can't put my finger on it. Is it something yeah. uh, in particular, but it's almost like, like Chinese a wild, spice. Yeah, or a wild yeah, also, berry you know, aspect. And I forgot to mention this. There's really a savory smoked meaty quality that's almost like Syrah. Um, and, I, and, the, and to Li Meng's point, the Chinese five spice and the smoky, you know, meaty quality, and then this huge amount of fruit, blueberry, to me, are the markers for Zweigelt. Yeah. For me, it's always like when you take um, IHOP syrup and then infuse Lapsang Sushong tea. And then oh, yeah. Well. That is brilliant. <laughs> it's brilliant. Very geeky, but brilliant. I love it. Um, I have to apologize for those of you who did do what Evan tells you to do and taste this wine ahead of time and then did the quick picks and then went, I don't know what this is. Wait, it's not what it's on the label. We did have a technical difficulty because we had never put a Zweigelt into MTW kits before. So if you were looking for it, it literally was done overnight to add this wine in. So I apologize for the technical glitch, but we had to make sure that Zweigelt was an answer and we only did it today or last night. So and thank diversify, you and diversified our regional choices as well, too, as far as, as yep. the terroir goes. Anyway, beautiful shot of uh, Martin. I'm going to hang with that guy. He looks like a lot of fun. All right, let's move on to number five. I'm determined to move through this one quickly because I do want to get Mari Boku time on the end. So we're going to quickly just look at the color. Note that it's not quite as deep as the last one, uh, although it's still deep. And it's not quite as purple as the last one. I would call this more of a deep ruby. Edge is sort of uh, a, a, a medium. And it does have a good amount of extraction. I'm getting uh, color in my tears. I'm getting a reasonably slow tears. And it suggests to me, Warmth it suggests to me, depth suggests to me, some thickness on the skins. Uh, let's go ahead and give it a, a nose. Always, you know me, I look for a few things. Let's talk about the fruit character here. And uh, we've got fruit. Um, it's not necessarily as uh, oozing as the last one was, our Zweigelt friend, but I am getting berries. Um, I'm getting cherries in there, both black and uh, red in nature. There is a sort of smokiness to this wine here, although not as... Um, Carbony smoky as the last one was, just sort of like more of a sweet smoke element. There's some herbs, there's some peppers, there's some chocolate, there's some uh, tomato or tomato leaf going on there, a little bit of tea, a bit of dark fig, and uh, a bit of lavender. I'm just sort of conflating everything together uh, there. Some greens, maybe some licorice or anise uh, character, and then distinctive minerality. Uh, I am definitely getting both a, a dust or turned dried earth character, but also a stoniness. Uh, from it too. And then as you peek through the back, then the oak starts to come up. And while I wouldn't call this wine by any stretch of imagination an oak bomb, I would tell you that the oak uh, plays an important place um, in the aroma. I'm sure it will when we taste it in the mouth um, to the personality of the wine. I'm getting a little bit of mocha. I'm getting a little bit of dark chocolate. I'm getting a, a hint of vanilla or vanilla bean, a little bit of, um, of sort of spiciness, sort of sweet brown spice, maybe a little bit of cardamomy, exotic spice there. And it's more of a frame. It doesn't jump out at you and sort of say, here's wine, here's oak, but it frames the oak really nicely. In the palate. The wine has density, it has volume, um, and it's also supple. There's, uh, there's tannin there, and the tannins are sort of deceptively soft, although there's ample amounts of them. So whatever they're doing in the terms of the tannin management is quite a surprise. There's a bit of bitterness there, which is both, again, sort of the grapes, grape skins, the tannins, and uh, a creaminess. That calls medium plus pushing. Uh, tannins, I said before, are sort of, they're medium plus. They're just not particularly uh, astringent or gritty. Uh, the length on the wine is long and deceptive. It just keeps rolling and going and going. So what I take here is this is a wine that probably is fairly ferocious by definition, but kind of like uh, Siegfried and Roy in Las Vegas, they've tamed <laughs> the tiger. And I think that's a really good example of what you can do when you make winemaking with intent to um, allow the wine to be something what it is, but also understand who your market may be. I think that's a really interesting expression. So what do we got here? We got a couple of uh, directions we could go from the standpoint of grapes. Um, Carmenere, Carmenere blend. Uh, those wines tend to have a lot of sort of greenness to them. You're familiar with Carmenere, be it from Colchagua, where our Sauvignon Blanc was from, or Maipo, or other parts there. But it's definitely on the green bell peppery, or when it's really ripe red bell peppery, or Pasilla 
uh, roasted pasilla peppery side of things. You have Cab Franc, which tends to be also sort of green in its own way, more of that sort of bay leafy uh, kind of character that Tim talked about before, leafiness in general uh, is there, and more red fruit, pure red fruit. It usually doesn't have a lot of black fruit to it. Tempranillo, depending on where it comes from, can be sort of elegant and um, uh, subtle like you find in parts of Rioja, like in the Alavesa. It can be big and brooding like you might find in Ribera del Duero, and it could be everywhere in between. We've got some other varieties, and then we've got some spots on earth. Don't forget, uh, Spain is home to Tempranillo, but Portugal is also home to Tempranillo. It just doesn't go into the name. Tempranillo could be Aragones, Aragones if you were in the Alentejo, or it could be Tinta Rorish, if you were up in the Douro. So it's a big part of the Iberian personality. Uh, there's Tempranillo grown in Argentina as well. It's a big part of uh, La Rioja, as uh, as many of us know. And Chile, of course, is where your Carmen is going to be. And some really dynamite Cab Franc and Cab Franc blends there, although they don't win any Tempranillo prizes. Awesome. All right. I have, I see now about 70%, Evan, 75% uh -huh. even in the old world. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. some between uh, Spain and Portugal, and mm -hmm. we have almost a ninety percent on Tempranillo. So I think we should go. Yeah, let's go. Let's play that. Let's play roulette. Roll the dice. Goodbye. You know what they call the the, the French term for that quaffable, crunchable, porch pounding character is called gouleon. G-O-U-L-E-Y-A-N-T. And it's a term that they define simply logistically as being drinkable, but it's a wine that just provides deliciousness and pleasure. So everyone, you should add gouleon into your vocabulary for drinkability. Here we are in Spain, España. And here we are uh, in an area specifically that is somewhat onomatopoetic to the style of wines that usually come from here. And this is made up at Bodegas Vatan. And Bodegas Vatan uh, sits literally in the heart of Toro and is made from Tempranillo. The Tempranillo here is called Tinta del Toro or Red of Toro. Now, all of you are probably going, I get it, Evan. Sounds like a bull, Toro, the bull and all that. But in this case, it's a duality of meaning because not only does it like strong like bull, but it's also the name of the town that the name that the actual appellation is named after. Believe it or not, there is a little town or village called Toro in the appellation of Toro. So what's this uh, clone or, or, or selection of, of Tempranillo is, is called uh, Tinta del Toro. It's a thicker skinned uh, uh, selection. Of, by the way, there were 95 Tempranillo selections in Spain. And when I got back to talking to uh, a grape sleuth in uh, Rioja last week, he was telling me that very much like apples in our part of the world, they're down to like four, uh, two of which are planted only wow. now in Rioja. It's really very sad. But this is one of the clones that survived and very well does well in hot weather. Um, it is pure 100% Tinta del Toro. It comes from an area called the Finca Las Quemadas, which means the burned vineyard. And it is a hundred uh, plus a hundred. The vineyard was actually originally planted in 1900. It's on ungrafted or what they call Pe Franco uh, or, or, or French French feet, which means it's an ungrafted vine in sandy soils, which makes sense because the phylloxera doesn't hang there and do well there. And 122 year old vines in some cases, obviously parts of the vineyard have been replanted. Uh, it's got wonderful moderate plus acid. It's got that nice, rich, generous ABV, but it's got this smoothness of tannin. And if anybody's had wines from Toro before, they are usually strong like bull. Uh, and this wine is amazingly uh, round and not mean uh, whatsoever. Uh, the producer of the wine is called Bodegas Fatan. That's the name of the house, the winery, if you will. But this um, wine leads under the guiding hand of the man, the myth, the legend himself, a gentleman named Jorge Ordonez. And Jorge Ordonez is known to many of us here in America as being an importer who's brought many uh, true wine. That's a beautiful shot of there. And, and again, mm -hmm. old bush, look at the old bush vines and that sort of very Crazy. unfertile soil. But um, he's known, and you have dam over the river there. Um, he's known at the Duero River, same thing, but Pacific River comes through as being sort of like the man. Um, not only is he identified, and there's Jorge, um, as, as sort of identifying amazing vineyards and stuff, but helping shape and define wine style. So he's really taken wines that were often backwards. You could argue many Toro wines are backwards and bringing them into the modern age. Never go on a wine trip with him unless you don't want to sleep. 
uh, for days because he is uh, <laughs> known for producing death march wine trips, but their producers are always really, really good. I love these shots. I mean, the vineyards being so close, close to the ground and their age of their vines, that's just amazing. Beautiful yeah. wine. And I yeah. hope people can appreciate what Evan and his team does when they select wines. If you go back to wine number one, you've kind of gone not only all over the globe, you've kind of gone back in time, back and forth in vintages too. Because we had a 15 um, earlier and now we're on a 19 and we're, we're kind of, you know, depending on what variety we're having. So very exciting. Maddie, it's all yours. Ooh, am I? Uh, I'm not. You're, yeah. Yay! Yes, you're all good. You're all <laughs> you know, ready. I I wanted to encourage the people that might be having one of those, you know, hollow stomach moments, going, "Oh my God!" You know, I have a hard enough time identifying Bordeaux and Sauvignon Blanc. What am I going to do with Zweigelt and um, uh, Tempranillo from Toro? But I really, one of my favorite things about Master of the World is it exposes us all. I mean, us included to uh, quality wines from everywhere. And even if you're going through um, a process of certification and you know you are hell bent on a deductive practice, it's important to remember everything and to taste everything because it plays into um, uh, final conclusions. And frankly, it gives you a breath. And I think it's important to be able to recognize quality, even if it's from something you're not gonna find um, in an MS exam, just saying. So uh, that said, thank you for that MTW. Okay, and I get uh, over 10 minutes on wine number six. Wow, I don't know what to do with it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so excited. Bravo, everyone, bravo. Bravo, so a generosity of my, uh, my colleagues. Um, so, you know, turn the wine in the glass. It's painting the glass, you know. So we've got extract galore here. The center is possibly whatever you want to call it, either, you know, black ruby or purple, and it lightens to uh, a violet rim. There's no gradation of color um, other than, you know, this wine is speaking extracted and young, period, end of story. I don't think you have to uh, overthink it. And uh, I, I say this every time we taste, because it's one of my favorite things that's ever come out of your mouth, Tim. Uh, you know, especially when it comes to looking at wine, uh, don't start drawing conclusions at this moment, because even though there's a part of you that is desperate to know what the wine is <laughs> when you're blind tasting. But I always think that the visual, where it really comes into play is when you circle back, particularly when you're stuck and it'll sort of nudge you out of, um, well, let's look at it. This can't be Pinot Noir, right? So it's definitely um, thick skinned um, varietal that's lending plenty of color extract and it is young. Let's see, aromatically. This to me um, immediately smells integrated. And I, oh, actually I forgot to look at our questions. Um, ah, yes. Uh, describing the quality or the character of the fruit. You know, and you can look at the range of fresh, just ripe, fully ripe, jammy, cooked, confected. And sometimes wines can express both, hold that thought. Um, if there are any specific spices that draw your attention, remember the broad strokes or the sweet baking spices that often, not always, uh, spell the use of oak. And then the savory spices. Um, that can be, you know, what a grape variety carries around in its pocket with regularity. And then finally, um, getting into the habit of really qualifying the tannins. It's fine to say medium, medium plus high, but are they edgy? Are they drying? Are they austere? Are they finely grained? Um, it's nice to be able to um, qualify with a little bit of subtlety. So that said, I'm going back to the fragrance on this and it's a beautiful fragrance, it's integrated. And that's the first thing that occurs to me is it's a combination of red, blue and black fruit that is um, both ripe, not verging on overripe, but quite ripe, but there's a freshness to it that's wonderful. And integrated oak, the oak is melted into the, um, the fragrance of the ripe fruit in the form of maybe a little bit of uh, caramel but it's not commanding my attention in the least. I think there's actually a little bit of dried fruit in there as well, but maybe it might be um, dried flowers that I'm smelling, lavender and violet. And we mention lavender and violet a lot in red wines, because that's how usually, you know, a floral will rear its head in the presence of a red. Um, 
I'm going to go ahead and taste it right away because I'm curious to see if it's as integrated on the palate as, as, in, as it is on the nose, but I will mention another element aromatically that is quite distinct. There's a cool element of um, herbs that are both fresh and dry and mixed herbs like um, uh, Arab de Provence and a little bit of a fresh character too. Maybe it's um, uh, a little bit of a fennel anise uh, character to it. Mm -hmm. I'm tiptoeing through the, the tulips, Lee Mang, because I have hours to talk about this wine. <laughs> <laughs> You're so funny. I'm just so excited. You know? Compared to what you usually get, I'm I love purring. it. Usually, I'm Usually, you know, freight yep. train. No, no, I won't. So on the palate, and I, as is my habit, and I love that um, um, uh, Tim likes to retaste. I just retaste sort of in rapid succession to really understand the mouthfeel. I have to be honest, you guys, this is this this tasting, I feel like has turned me around because there are a couple of surprises. And so by now I'm like, wait, what is it again? You know, oh, but, but, you know, isn't that great? I actually uh, like to forget what the wines are so I can taste them um, with an innocent aspect and be honest to them. I mean, it's great to know what they are, but actually I try to push that to the back of my head so that my reactions can be uh, fresh along with the people that are tasting <laughs> with us. What I love about this, I'm going to zero in on the mouthfeel immediately. It's got fresh acidity. It's got, you know, we could qualify it as medium plus tannins that are gently drying. Um, uh, Evan used the term crunchy. That's what this feels like to me, a little crunchy, but not in any way austere. And it doesn't um, hide the flavor of the fruit. Everything I smell is um, reflected on the palate. There's an integration here as well. And I'm going to ask myself the question, is this a mono varietal or is it a blunt? Because I don't think that there's a dominant expression of um, one grape. If I were to um, define the fruit, I would say it's a combination of black and red raspberry, though I think there's a little bit of blue in there as well. The floral comes through on the palate. There's this really pleasant, slight bitterness that's like um, arugula-like. Um, and then mm -hmm. there are the herbs, um, both fresh and dried, Herbe de Provence. Um, Evan brought me back a little, a little packet of Herbe de Provence from Provence, <laughs> and I've just been in pig heaven playing with it. Um, some black olives. Um, let's go to the, 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 um, oak again, it's completely oh. integrated, but there it is a little bit of dark chocolate, a little bit of caramel. Is there an earth expression? Yes. And for me, it's more, um, sort of turned dirt, uh, and clay. I find <coughs> this, um, it, and it finishes long, but you know, it's going to be longer in a few years. This wine is a lot about promise based on the quality of the fruit. Um, the finish is long, but more textural than flavor wise. And I think it's a medium to medium, full bodied, um, integrated red of great quality with a touch of um, organic earth. Uh, let's look at our grape variety options, which I haven't meditated on. Tempranillo blend, which we've discussed previously. And just remember, Tempranillo can air incarnate in many different ways. You know, the, uh, you know, we had the Toro that we just experienced. But if you want to talk about Rioja Gran Reserva, there's a different animal altogether. Um, Grenache blend or a Syrah blend. Gee, Madeline, aren't those similar? Eh, not really, depending on which grape variety is dominant. Certainly Grenache um, all on its own as a mono varietal will be um, significantly more see-through than this, right? And closer to Pinot and its mouthfeel expression, but you dump a little Syrah and Grenache in there, I mean, and Morvedra in there, and it can change the color and the mouthfeel dramatically. Um, and if it's dominantly Syrah, I would look to, you know, are we getting pepper tones? Are we getting um, herbal tones? Are we getting any smoked meat? Um, you know, and does this color speak Syrah? It cer certainly seems to. Um, region wise, old world, new world. Uh, if we're leaning back towards Tempranillo, certainly Spain. Uh, if we're leaning into Grenache or Syrah, certainly France. Um, our new world options, California, Australia. But I would say both for old vine Grenache and Syrah, Australia is, a, you know, a big contender. Uh, I have to say, I just love the polish of this wine and polish not in a pejorative way, um, the polish in that they're using absolutely pristine fruit. They're not overworking it. 
And I think we should, sh oh, well. Oh, hello. unanimity, hello. <laughs> I think I'm gonna get a reputation for leading everyone home. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that, damn it. You know? <laughs> I was just going to say. Um, and old world, oh, this is, wait, can you, I can't see this. How much, how many people are voting for the new world? Hold the boat. Uh, ah, so uh, less than 20% old world. We're going to either California, Australia with almost 70% of the people going Australia. But I'll tell you, if this is Aussie, this certainly isn't your basic over extracted, clunky, over oaked, you know, um, uh, Shiraz that, that, you know, that really tragically uh, gave the country a reputation that it doesn't deserve at all because the quality of Syrah and Grenache in Australia can be and often is stunning. What is it, Limang? And so, Maddie, as I'm pulling this mm -hmm. up, will you explain, because we do have 17% in this old world, mm -hmm. um, what do you think helps everyone get to the new world? What was it about this wine? Well, I'm going to even go backwards, if you don't mind, for a sec. Um, yeah. To me, especially if it's Syrah dominant and mm -hmm. it is from the old world, AKA like Northern Rhone, it's gonna have more of a compelling meaty character like smoked meat. One of my friends calls it the Jimmy Dean um, quality. Mm -hmm. And this is a vegan vegetarian talking, <laughs> right? Um, <laughs> I think the expression, um, you know, that would be it for me and a little bit a stronger earth element. And I also think not as um, Northern Rhone especially tends to be, um, almost obnoxious in its expression of that meat and spice and uh, in a way that Americans that aren't familiar with Northern Rhone or haven't made peace with it don't necessarily find attractive. It's not as integrated, as seamless, as um, pretty as this wine is. But this is, by the way, a blend. It is dominantly um, Shiraz, I, you know, lucky enough to go to Australia and I, I, I got corrected uh, multiple times that it's Barassa and Shiraz. This is from an absolutely wonderful winery called Henschke, 150 years in climbing in terms of their contribution. They, um, you know, they have vineyards uh, throughout Barassa, both in Barassa Valley and Eden Valley. And this winery, at least according, you know, their, their label says Eden Valley, but it does contain some Barossa fruit. And uh, it is named Henry's Seven, after someone who is not one of their, um, their ancestors, but a guy that in the 1850s planted um, seven acres um, mm -hmm. in uh, Kinaton. And we're talking um, in the area where the Henschkes have their vineyards in um, uh, Northern uh, Barassa and Eden Valley. Um, you know, tragically, his wife, Sarah, after he died in 1868, this is worth repeating, you know, she had very strong temperance convictions and um, basically uh, ripped all the vines out no. or had them <laughs> grafted um, uh, onto oh. currants or replaced with apple trees. But nonetheless, the Henschkes are honoring um, Henry Evans here. Um, this in terms of a blend is 72% uh, Shiraz, which is uh, co-fermented with a little, little splash of Viognier, less than 5%. Mm. And mm. it's got significant amounts of Grenache and Morvedra, almost equal portions, 13 and 12%. Um, what, what I mentioned in the middle of my comments, um, and I still come back to it, is this doesn't speak a mono varietal to me. It speaks of um, Shiraz that's um, beautifully integrated with two grape varieties that get along with it really nicely. And certainly that much more Vedra will pump up the um, the color. And Grenache color-wise doesn't have a chance against uh, Morvedra and Shiraz, but certainly it adds to both white and uh, black pepper spice. I, I love the expression of fruit on this. You know, everyone talks about Stephen Henschke, who's on the far left, but Prue, who's holding that like too cute for words baby, is um, actually as uh, much of a player, if not more than he is in terms of the quality of Henschke, because she has, you know, run towards organic and biodynamic viticulture. Uh, and he will proudly, you know, purr about how important she is to the quality of uh, Henschke's mm -hmm. wines. This one is moderately priced, which I think is just wonderful that the Henschke's offer everything from, um, you know, uh, in terms of price point. 
and concentration and age worthy and affordable versus, you know, nosebleed wines um, to all if of I us. If I tried to put Hill of Grace in here, Lee Mang would beat me. So it's. Well, no. and Tim and I would be horrified beyond belief, but we'd be <laughs> thrilled to taste it. But I, you guys like this as much as I do. I just think it's a beautiful expression. Oh, a uh, parting shot of this combination of both refreshing um, fruit and um, and ripe fruit. And I wanna remind us that the Eden Valley is significantly higher in altitude um, mm -hmm. than uh, Barasa. It's like, uh, you know, pushing, um, what is it? 1500 uh, feet above sea level. It's got like two weeks yep. longer growing period, you know, so the wine, the vines can get uh, ripe. So temperatures are significantly lower. And I think, you know, you can see this in this wine where there's an elegance to it. There's nothing heavy handed. I don't know what the um, alcohol claims to be 14 and a half. But boy, it sure doesn't command my attention. I, I think this kit is the one that I'm going to take down to my family in L.A. <laughs> there are just so many like surprises and yet some staples. Mm. Um, wait, I just described every kit and I. <laughs> <laughs> I want to say one parting shot. We don't talk about this often, but I was thrilled the other day talking to Tim, who's my tasting guru, you know, yay, he's coming out with the book any second now. But the importance of mid palate in, um, mm -hmm. in really assessing quality of fruit. And I think if you just hold this wine on your palate, you will get it. That beautiful combination of perfectly ripe, you know, dominantly red, but blue and black fruit and all the spice coming through.